This is Max Allen Collins. Please stick around and help me solve the incredible mystery of Mr. Media. Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to Bob Greenberger, author of a really cool new coffee table book, Star Trek, The Complete Unauthorized History. Stick around. Logic clearly dictates that the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. So there. Today's episode of Mr. Media Interviews is brought to you by GoDaddy.com. You know GoDaddy.com from their wild and sexy commercials, but isn't it time you actually test drove their web hosting and domain registration services yourself? For a limited time, Mr. Media listeners can save 10% on the already low price of web hosting services at GoDaddy.com by entering the promo code POD4 at checkout. Again, that's 10% off web hosting when you go to GoDaddy.com and enter the promo code POD4, that's P-O-D, the number 4, at checkout. Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience of pointy-eared Trekkies, uh, Trekkers, uh, insufferable geeks who care more about what they're called than taking a regular bath. In the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. Does anybody really believe that the world needs another book about the phenomenon that is Star Trek? Not me. And probably not my guest today, Bob Greenberger. But because ST, TC, UH, I'm sorry, Star Trek, The Complete Unauthorized History, was written by the esteemed Mr. G., I was curious to have a look. Based on his history, both inside and outside of comics and sci-fi fandom, it seemed likely that he, of all people, could find some genuine nuggets of unique Trekness. And let me tell you, this book sparkles with Star Trek goodness and flashes of wit on every page. It doesn't take itself too seriously, but tells a good story within a story of a story. Now, I've read a lot about Star Trek and its creator, Gene Roddenberry, over the years. I was there. I saw Classic Trek when it was originally broadcast on NBC in the late 1960s. I fought with my old man when he thought I watched too many reruns in the 70s and dutifully watched every episode of every series since then, from the next generation to my personal favorite, Enterprise. And, of course, I've seen all the films, including J.J. Abrams' brilliant reimagining of the entire uh, Enterprise, if you will. (laughs) So believe me when I tell you that the pages of Bob Greenberger's new book radiate a freshness like a just-born Tribble. And that's whether he's found an obscure factoid or an entertaining photo of a rare Star Trek toy or a set piece. Whether you yourself love Star Trek or just know someone who does, Star Trek, the complete unauthorized history, should be on your holiday shopping list. And Bob Greenberger, welcome to Mr. Media. Thank you, sir. Pleasure to be here. Seems like it took us forever to get to this point, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, man. Journey takes its time. Yeah, anything good. Uh, so, you know, because of the way I introduced you, I have to ask, whose idea was it to do another Star Trek book? Voyager Press, which is uh, an imprint of Keyside Books up in uh, Minnesota, had the idea um, to do more pop culture books after the success of a Led Zeppelin book. And they were thinking, what is a real pop culture phenomenon that would be known globally? And they settled on Star Trek. Uh, One of the editors there is a gentleman named Scott Pearson, who has written some Star Trek fiction and recommended me to the company. They reached out to me. I said, why, sure. (laughs) And uh, we went from there. But how do you – now, I mentioned – I mean, there's been an awful lot written about Star Trek. Magazines, newspapers, books. I mean, there's podcasts. I mean, there's so much stuff. And you've been around this stuff. I know. I mean, pretty much probably all your professional life, if not longer, you know. Um, Yeah. You know, you have to approach something like this, I would think, especially when it comes from 
uh, outside uh, and you think, well, you know, do I really just want to do a rehash? There's plenty of that out there. It seems to me there's a lot of, I said this, I mean, I put my reputation out there. It seemed like there's a lot of fresh, interesting stuff to read in here that, you know. Well, well, thanks. I appreciate that. It just means the, I did my homework well. Um, the answer to that is because pocketbooks stopped doing nonfiction about Star Trek some years ago. And because it was the 90s and early 2000s where we had a run of these memoirs from the original cast and from the production side of the company, um, there hasn't really been a comprehensive look at the show in a good number of years. Uh, certainly not since Voyager and Enterprise, not since the J.J. Abrams reboot. Uh, so that, to me, felt like there was an opportunity to take a look, step back, take a look, see where we've come. And one of the things that most interested me was when Keyside came to me and they said, we want the history of Star Trek, but we also want you to make sure that you keep uh, the fans in mind, keep the, move, the fan movement parallel. Mm -hmm. And I thought that's the key to make this really unique from um, any other book that's been about Star Trek history, because most will tell the history of the TV show and the movies or the spinoffs. And there have been a number of books a long time ago, clearly 15, 20 years easily, since there have been any real books about the fan movements. Hmm. Combining the two made this feel really fresh. Yeah. So I really uh, jumped on that opportunity. I would agree. I mean, it, it, it doesn't feel like something I've read six times before, even once before. And... You know, I hadn't thought about it. I guess it's because I'm I'm uh, rapidly aging. I, I I you know aren't we all? Well, I mean, you know, you know, I mean, in the the 70s and the early 80s, there were a lot of books and a lot of stuff written about the show, the original show, and then Next Generation, the, and then you know, like you said, uh, everyone wrote their uh, memoirs. And so, from my perspective, I was thinking, you know, when I I heard about, uh, you know, I saw you online doing this, and I heard about it, I thought. Geez, another Star Trek book. Is that really? But you make a really valid point that there are generations of kids, young people, uh, even older people, who've watched the series since, say, Next Generation, and they they haven't gotten the same type of uh, coverage. And and then when you put all that together, and you I guess you figure there's a there's a whole generation uh, that hasn't seen these books fresh and new. And put that all together. I mean, that, I guess that explains why I found it so entertaining. Well, thank you. Um... Well, think about this. In 1966, Star Trek debuted on NBC, and adults to kids were watching William Shatner and Leonard Nimoy and company. And then 22 years later, yeah. right? 1988, Next Generation. That's a generation. Those kids who watched it, 8, 9, 10 years old, are now in their 30s having their own kids and watching the show with their kids creating that whole other generation. Yeah. And I hate to say it, you know, we're more than, you know, 20, 22 years past Next Generation's debut. So that means there's potentially that third generation being born into the J.J. Abrams Star Trek. Mm -hmm. Their Captain Kirk's going to be Chris Pine and not William Shatner. Right. Well, uh, my daughter uh, watched would watch Enterprise with us every week. Uh, you know, when she was she's 16 now. I I can't remember. It's been five or six years, maybe maybe a little longer since that that was on the air. And mm -hmm. she loved that show. We all loved it. It was a great show. We'd watch together. And as it got better instead of worse, it was even more compelling television. And then of course when the uh, first Star Trek came out, I mean, you know, she she loved Chris Pine and right. uh, Zachary. Quinto and Akinto, whatever the hell, it's, however it's pronounced, um, and so yeah, I mean, I, I, I really, I can see that, and uh, that makes good sense, and and yet, you know, it's interesting that you still found even in the original classic stuff, the classic track, there's still there's a lot of stuff in here that just feels fresh to me, largely because it's been so long since you may have read some of these books that you know some things have dropped off, but some of the other issues is that. There have been all these memoirs. There was all the, you know, just about every member of the original cast did memoirs. There were two different Roddenberry biographies shortly after his death. Um, his uh, secretary slash lover, Susan Sackett, 
wrote and practically self-published her own memoirs. Um, and then the producers um, and executive uh, Herb Solo and Robert Justman did their Inside Star Trek book uh, in the early 1990s. And that gave us a whole other perspective. I found in reviewing this material that there were a lot of contradictory versions of how a scene was filmed, how a script was written. I, and I said this uh, in a couple of places, I felt like I had to put my referee shirt on and try and read all of the accounts and determine who actually said what when. <laughs> um, you know, one of the great legends about Star Trek is the fact that the second season was a really bad season and it needed to be saved. I went and researched and discovered that NBC had already pretty much renewed the show for the back end of the second season in October, mere weeks after the show um, started their second season. So it wasn't really on death's door, hmm. but the ratings weren't great. It was definitely not winning its time slot. The science of demographics was in its infancy, so they didn't quite understand what was going on with the audience. And that meant that it was a bubble show, what we, what we know today. And that's when Roddenberry, to his credit, secretly funded the Save Star Trek campaign. And only admitted to it when it was successful and NBC renewed it. And then build Paramount for reimbursement for the 900 and change that it cost them. Mm. And, you know, I didn't know that myself until the documentation came up in one of those two Roddenberry biographies. What, what, what would you say, I mean, if you could pick out, let's say two things, because we don't want to give everything away here. We want people to read the book. Uh, but if you could pick out two things that, uh, to you, whether it comes from classic Trek or, over, you know, later, um, let's say two or three things that, people will find, even if they think that they know everything that there is to know about Star Trek, maybe they don't know that it's in this book. Well, later fans who came on uh, to Star Trek in the 80s and 90s probably don't know about the, the torturous 1970s for fans, where Paramount could not make up their mind. Did they want a TV show? Did they want a movie? Did they want more animated uh, they couldn't seem to make up their mind. And then by the end of the decade, we finally got a movie that didn't really knock our socks off as we had hoped and had demanded. Um, so I think some people will find the versions of what the Star Trek movie could have been um, when Phil Kaufman was going to direct it. Mm -hmm. um, that's interesting. Um, I think we learned something about what went into Voyager not living up to its expectations by abandoning its premise after one episode because of some audience research done for, next, uh, for, done for Deep Space Nine mm -hmm. that informed decisions for Voyager. Uh, and then finally, I think, you know, we finally might put to rest um, the rumor or belief that Roddenberry always had Nimoy in mind for Spock. Which yeah, that was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was very interesting. So those are three. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was just thinking as you were saying, as you were talking about this, uh, I, uh, you know, I think, I, there, I guess there's two points in my life where I, well, three points in my life where I really feel like I connect to Star Trek. One is, uh, uh, I, well, actually, okay, like a couple. Bear with me a second. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the episode, oh, you know, and I just looked it up and I can't remember what they were called. The episode, uh, you know, with the, uh, the guys with the giant heads. The Telosians from the original pilot, The Cage. Right, the Telosians. Okay. When, when, and and uh, at the end of that episode where they seem to be watching us, watching them, or, you know, they're... Right, they're, yeah. Um, scared the living crap out of me <laughs> as, like, a six- or seven-year-old boy. I had nightmares uh, of, for that. And I remember staying up late with my... It wasn't late, but it was late for me as a young kid, uh, you know, with my dad and, and watching that. And, uh, and that just scared me. And then, as I mentioned in the introduction, years later... Uh, my dad would come in and he'd see me watching Star Trek and he'd just get come walk in, turn it off and says, get out of the house. You watch too much of that damn crap, you know. <laughs> and then years later, I think it was the fourth Star Trek movie, the one with the whales. Yes. Um, I remember sitting, we, we, it was opening night, sitting in the front row 
with my, uh, my girlfriend, uh, soon to be wife, and it was the first time I remember uh, leaning over as the movie started. I leaned over and said, I love you for the first time. So I have that, and she always reminds me of that when we see that on TV. And then the last thing, I'm just making my own connection here as a fan. Uh, the last thing was wa- watching uh, Enterprise, uh, the series, with my daughter and realizing right. it had gone from my dad to me to my kid. And it's just, uh, you know, it's just a very personal thing, I think, for people, at least for me. Well, my first exposure to the original series was I w- had gone to bed. I got up and went down to the kitchen. I can't remember why because I was like seven. And I remember looking past the kitchen into the family room where my father was watching a show, and I distinctly remember being mesmerized by the transporter effect. Uh, But it meant my father was sitting there watching Star Trek, and I watched him watch it, and then he let me watch um, an episode or two uh, the following season. It was like, I got hooked. That's very cool. I liked uh, you, you, you retell, and this is a story that has been told before, but I, I like I like that you brought it up the uh, Nichelle Nichols uh, story about how she was planning to quit, and then uh, she she was introduced to uh, Martin Luther King. Uh, well, it's important to remember Star Trek's place in the 1960s, which was such a turbulent era, and it's one of the most oft-told stories about the original series. But it's an important one mm-hmm. to remember the influence seeing a black person in a serious, competent, professional role on network television was a rarity in 1966. Mm. What, I was going to say, uh, it, 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 talking about other characters, uh, Star Trek characters, I was just thinking about, besides Nichelle Nichols, um, who would have guessed uh, that two of the uh, actors uh, who played um, on Star Trek and Next Generation, who would still be so visible in the public eye today would be uh, George Takei uh, from the original and, of all people, Will Wheaton from Next Generation. I mean, that the two of them are everywhere. Well, you know, the interesting thing about George is in even though he and, and Shatner don't always see eye to eye and there's that rivalry out there, um, he's taken a page from Shatner's playbook. He's played himself. He's let himself have fun with being George Takei. He has recognized that his performance as Sulu, that his high-profile work on Star Trek, not only led to some stage and screen work afterwards, but also got him into politics, but also therefore made him an important role model. So coming out was very important to him. Uh, Marrying... um, his longtime boyfriend Brad was certainly a big step, and being able to make fun of some of that stereotypical nonsense and um, having a good time with it by being a regular on the Howard Stern show and really has given him this whole other lease on life, uh, which I think is fabulous. Yeah, and 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 so that's George, and yeah, I knew you. I figured you were going to get to the Stern thing last because that's the yeah. that's the craziest piece of the whole puzzle. And he's he's hysterical on there, and he'll you know he's got a you great know, sense of humor, and you know he doesn't really admit to it often. Stern's a fan, yeah, of Star Trek. You know, he, he, there's a classic geek under that all that hair. Well, and we you know he he's a very admitted uh, big comic book fan, so that's not. Oh yeah, the, the, I actually uh, once um, was on the Stern show talking uh, Superman trivia with him because he got on to the topic one day and arranged with DC to have an expert. Hmm. talk to him so i was there the next day that was fun and what about even probably the even less likely guy to have a career uh the way he has is will wheaton i mean he he uh he he latched onto the internet a, a very early on ma- made himself a, a you know a, a personality and now right. he's basically i mean he, he he did eureka for seasons he did the guild with uh, uh, Felicia, Felicia, Felicia Day, Day. and yeah. now he's a recurring character as Will Wheaton on the biggest show on television, The Big Bang Theory. It is absolutely incredible, but I think his being an early adopter and being honest with his audience about, yeah, I think oh, you know Wesley was this and Wesley was that, and yeah, I, you know, I definitely had to distance myself from. I mean, I think his honesty mm-hmm. um, helped tremendously, and I also think he's just a cool guy. I've yeah. never met him, but you know that's what he comes across in the interviews and online. You follow his tweet, uh, his tweets; they're re- really entertaining. 
Um, he's managed to reinvent himself very nicely in a very different way than George has. Yeah, and and you know it's interesting. Even if none of that had happened, it turns out that his college roommate is Chris Hardwick, the host of The Nerdist, which is like the number one podcast in in, in the world. And so he's he pops up there because after Star Trek, I think it was after yeah it was after Star Trek they went to college together. It's just the I mean the guys the guys the guys got a bit of a blessed life. I mean, uh, no clearly. Doubt. Yeah. And I think people have forgiven him for Wes- Wesley's <laughs> excesses. Yeah. I think because he was able to laugh of it, laugh at it. I think, you know, I think that, that, that does a lot of that. Um, and, and, you know, I got to give him credit. He was gracious enough to make that really brief cameo in nemesis mm-hmm. back in uniform for the wedding. Mm-hmm. Um, I, one of the things that was interesting in the book is there's a lot of great photos in the book. Yeah. Uh, and I got to say, I, I'm, I'm assuming here that the folks at thinkgeek.com must be in love with you. Um, they were very generous in sharing their archives with us, as were the people at Hall- Hallmark. Um, but when you're an unauthorized book, there legally there is so much material out there you cannot use. And obviously the um, lawyers at uh, Keyside were very, very careful to make sure that every photo... Um, made legal sense to include in the book and therefore pictures of the merchandise with the characters on them or the you know press appearances conventions um, um, but if anything that really also let us visually celebrate um, Star Trek's impact in so many different ways and products mm-hmm. no it's it, it's uh, it's very very cool I, I think you know I, I uh, people people need to look at the book Hello, puppy. <laughs> Who's this? Yeah, this is Ginger. Hi, Ginger. Ginger say hi to the fans. Hi, Ginger. This is this is funny. You know, I've been doing this for a couple of years, and in two days, I've had two dogs show up in, in interviews, and that hadn't happened. I don't I don't think that had happened, but once before. So that's very cool. Well, Ginger just had dinner, so she came to visit. Ah, well, that's very sweet. I like that. Um, uh, is there anything that in doing the research for this book that surprised you after all this time? Anything that you weren't expecting to discover? I think the amount of contradictory material that really became a challenge, especially for the original series. Um, also, the, the dearth of material I could find uh, beyond a couple of Voyager books and the lack of Enterprise books. Mm. So I really had to pull some strings to get a connection to Manny Cotto so I could interview him to talk about producing the final two seasons of Enterprise uh, so I could get some fresh perspective in there. Yeah, I had, uh, you know, knowing my, my daughter's love of Enterprise... Uh, I had gone to the bookstore looking for Enterprise books, and there's one that I know of. There was one novel uh, novelization uh, of a story that was done outside of the, the series. Uh, Early on, there was quite a, a, a dry spell for Voyager books, um, but they're back now. Yeah, but well, for Voyager, but Enterprise, the uh, the last series, uh, I found one novel. I don't know if there. Uh, Maybe you know. Oh, they've done, they've done a whole handful, and they've actually continued uh, original novels. Uh, a whole bunch written by Michael A. Martin, um, and then next year Chris Bennett, uh, Christopher L. Bennett, takes over um, the thread. But basically, season, the next season of the Enterprise plays out in the novels, including undoing the death of Trip. Oh, wow. Well, I will be going to Amazon after this interview to find those damn books, because I looked for my daughter, and, and she loved the first one that I found, and we just couldn't find any more, so... Yeah, there, there, there were very few during the run of the show, but afterwards, uh, when they had a little more freedom, they just ran with it. Oh, that's very cool. Very cool. Um, so you're getting good response to the fans, uh, fans are treating you well on this book? I'm not getting a lot of direct feedback. Uh, the comments on the Facebook page for the book have been uh, fairly positive and over at the Trek BBS uh, website. Um, just today, I got a note complimenting me overall on the book um, from Matt Jeffries, the original production designer's uh, son, and he pointed out a couple of mistakes r- related to his dad's work. But you know what? I cop to it. Um, the That's book all you can do, right? And the book is sold well enough they're already talking second printing where we can go in and fix it. And We're going to do right by Matt, who did so much for that show. Oh, that's great. 
That's great. Yeah. And I, I got to ask you, uh, kind of broadening the conversation a little bit, you've done a lot of uh, genre books over the years, uh, right. comics and Star Trek stuff. Uh, I, I had to ask, uh, do you have any favorites over the years, the things that you you know always still have a fondness for? Well, you always remember you first. And uh, my first solo novel was an extra-generation book, The Romulan Stratagem, which every now and then on places like Goodreads, I, people are still reading it and posting some very positive comments. So I guess I, I you know, did well there. So that was fun. Um, I also think the uh, Deep Space Nine collaboration with uh, Peter David and Michael Jan Friedman, Wrath of the Prophets, holds up fairly well. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, I grew up a major comic book fan, so being able to write an original Iron Man novel was sort of a dream come true. That was a lot of fun back uh, wow, five years already. And uh, uh, you did a book with Stan Lee. Yes. Um, Stan Lee's How to Write Comics. Um, Stan had signed this deal some years earlier and had some outlines prepared for each of the volumes. And then, of course, being Stan, you get really, really busy. Yes. Um, so through um, the, the publisher, Dynamite Entertainment, um, they reached out to me and they said, would you like to work with Stan on this? So Stan and I communicated, and uh, the challenge, the biggest challenge for me was taking Stan's outline and then not duplicating the really fine books on how to write comics that Denny O'Neill and Peter David have done, right. uh, and try and you know help Stan maintain his voice. And we got some other people interviewed uh, to help um, give multiple voices so that it's Stan and friends um, teaching how to write comics, and th- that was a lot of fun. I'm I'm sorry it did not get. Uh, more of a marketing push from Watson up to the Random House, but it's still out, it's still available, and I'm still proud of it. Uh, yeah, I mean, and, uh, you know, it's interesting. I, I wanted to ask you about that because, of course, Stan's legend is such that, you know, he would, th- in creating the comics himself, he was known for here's the here's the general plot, go, you know, and hand it off to the to the artist and have the artist and fill in the gaps and write dialogue and stuff. But, it, right. it, you know, the essence always came from Stan. And I, I suspected maybe that might have been the case in this book as well. Well, you know, the, inter- the interesting thing with Stan and what makes him so qualified to do this is starting in uh, 1940 when he got started at Marvel at 17 years old through now, he's written every genre you can imagine. Mm. And when Timely and then Atlas before Marvel... Um, went from fad to fad, Stan went from writing Captain America to Ziggy Pig to Millie the Model. Not every writer is that versatile and capable. He wrote Millie for 10 years, and when somebody said to him, maybe you should pass it on to somebody else, he goes, no, I got a million other ideas. I mean, he was never stopped. Uh, Al Jaffe tells a great story about when he was an associate editor at Marvel in the 50s, and they had a cover meeting in... um, Stan sat down with the art director and or art team, and Jaffe was there to take notes. And they had all the covers on the wall, and they, you know, needed maybe two dozen covers. Al figured it would take all day. In about half an hour, forty-five minutes, Stan just looked at it and said, "This, this, this happens. To this character. This happens to this character. This happens," to this, and just spouted off these great ideas without any stories yet and they went off and did covers and then he went back and did stories and that kind of versatility that kind of quick thinking um is what puts Stan in the position of having written literally thousands of stories before it was time to do the ff so he got all the bad stories out of his system he got all the really you know good monster ideas out of his system and good funny animal ideas and he was ready primed to do something different uh, so when his wife challenged him for Fantastic Four uh, to do what you want, he did, and magic happened. It's very cool. It's a great story. But yeah. So doing the book, um, you know, gave Stan a chance to you know think back to a lot of that and think back to a lot of what it meant to write these stories. Um, another incident was uh, some people were telling me about how Stan was really great about word balloon placement. Not something normal readers think about. And I went back to Stan and I said, Stan, everyone's talking about your word balloon play. What What's your feelings about it? He goes, you know, I don't remember. <laughs> I, just, I just do it. <laughs> so I had to ask around and I finally got Jim Salakrop, who was taught in part by Stan how to do this, where word balloons 
were treated by Stan as part of the artwork and therefore was strategically placed to either hide a missing background or a bad gesture. Um, and it was part of the page composition and it seems to have worked. Wow. That's great. I'm glad I, I'm glad I, glad I get asked you about that. I, I like, and you tell that with a lot of passion, which is a really, really, well, Stan brings it out. Of you. Uh, yeah, I'm sure. I know. I, I've, I've interviewed him once exchanged email with him a couple of times over the years and then amazingly he, he he exchanged email with my with my daughter several times which was like oh, sweet a huge thrill for her it was when he had the tv show going on uh, nice yeah. oh who wants to be a superhero yeah 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 she was a huge fan of that and then you know to get a couple emails from stan directly oh uh, yeah that was very cool he was very sweet. yeah uh my mom and stan share the same birthday um she's a little younger than he is and um, last year, he I made mention of it. He popped a, a note that I shared with my mom, wishing her best, and she was like, "Really? <laughs> that man is a national treasure. I, I hope that oh, yeah. I hope that we as a country uh, fully appreciate him. I, I think we do, but you know, I hope he feels it. Um, so, look before we wrap up, uh, uh, two more things. One of them is uh, two words, and uh, whatever your response is, will be fine. Uh, Bob Penaha. <laughs> <laughs> Bob and Hal is a great guy. Um, he was, I found him when he was lettering for Kamiko, I believe, mm -hmm. and was looking to break into DC. And, and we got along really, really well. And I, he was my number one lettering guy um, through my editing days at DC uh, through the 1980s. And he never failed to come up with an interesting sound effect or um, uh, type treatment for the uh credits um really enjoyed the material he was put on easy to work with was a fan of the material so every now and then he'd actually catch a you know something we missed go, well wait what about this or noticing you know we had the wrong person speaking and, and actually was tremendously helpful in making those books as clean and readable as possible I had to bring him up. He's a mutual acquaintance of both of ours. He taught me how to drive, for God's sakes. <laughs> uh, one of my oldest and dearest friends, and and I and he always spoke very highly of you. So I, I I thought it would be just completely wrong with us two Bobs getting together without mentioning him. So, well, any more we pass the maximum Bob Act. Yeah. So big shout out to Bob Penaha. Yeah. If you don't know him, you should know him, folks. That's all I can tell you. Uh, finally, what's uh, what's next for you? Moving from Star Trek to yet another franchise. Um, it's called After Earth. It's a Will Smith movie coming uh, coming out in June from Sony. Uh, it stars his son, Jaden Smith, and it's a father-son story set a thousand years in the future uh, on a planet that... ...or in near future, we have made Earth uninhabitable. Oh. And... How would that ever happen? You'll have to uh, <laughs> read our stories. Um, their movie is set specifically in on this planet in the future. And uh, Peter David, Michael, Jan Friedman, and I were hired by the production company Overbrook Entertainment, which is uh, Will Smith's company, with his brother-in-law, uh, Caleb uh, Pinkett. And they hired us to take the screenplay by Gary Whitta, who also wrote the Book of Eli, and... Flesh it out. Build the universe. Because they make reference to mankind leaving Earth in 2072, but they never say why. We had to say why. We had to figure it out. Mm. We had to figure out um, about this other alien life form that plays a role in the movie. Uh, we had to figure out how did humanity get to Nova Prime? How long did it take? What happened when they got there? How did the society and the culture um, develop? all based on a screenplay without seeing a single picture. Mm. And it was a challenge, but we came up with a 300-page Bible that covers th literally thousands of years of history, uh, which has then led to Mike, Peter, and myself being hired by Random House to produce a series of uh, prose works, uh, the first of which will be um, six short e-books, uh, about ten to 13,000 words each, uh, starting next month, December 14th, Peter kicks it off with the first one. And then uh, we have each written two of those. 
Then in March, uh, the three of us have collaborated on a prequel novel called A Perfect Beast. Uh, Peter's doing the novelization, which will be out in April. I've done what's called the Colonial Ranger Survival Manual, which will be out from Inside Editions in May. Um, and then uh, Mike and I also did a prequel comic book uh, one shot that came out from Dynamite Entertainment uh, in October. That's still available. So hopefully the movie will do well and we'll do more with it. But it's been a, a it's an interesting challenge to take a fresh franchise and avoid cliches and oh we did this in Star Trek we got to rethink how to do that. Yeah. Um, so creatively it was a tremendous amount of fun and we've had tre- terrific feedback from the guys over at Overbrook. Um, it is, it's been a really wonderful working relationship. That's great. That's great. And all I asked was what's next. <laughs> I got a great, I got a great story there. Thank you. Good stuff. You're welcome. All right. Well, folks, listen, uh, you can order, actually you must order Bob Greenberger's latest book, uh, Star Trek, the complete unauthorized history. It's in great bookstores everywhere, or you can order it right now at a great price right here, mrmedia.com. If you're watching the video, down below the video, you should see the cover of the book. Just yeah, exactly. No, don't point there. That's rude. Um, <laughs> anyway, it's below the video somewhere down there. Just click on it. It'll take you to Amazon. You can order it right now. I'm telling you, make a great gift for anyone you know who loves Star Trek. They will adore this book. Uh, Bob, uh, website, Twitter, fe- uh, Facebook, any of that stuff? I'm uh, Bob Greenberger at Facebook. At Bob Greenberger on Twitter, and it's www.bobgreenberger.com. So I'm fairly easy. I was going to say, it's not very clever of you, but okay, we'll take it. I, you know, I, I like simplicity sometimes. <laughs> very good. Well, uh, Bob, it was uh, a pleasure to talk to you today. We've, uh, we've passed a little bit professionally over the years, and I'm delighted Absolutely. to get this time with you. It's been my pleasure, Bob. It's been great getting to know you better now uh, as we were doing the setup and having this conversation. So thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Okay. You can see and hear almost a thousand Mr. Media interviews by visiting our main site, mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. Or check out the more than 200 video interviews on the Mr. Media radio site on YouTube. And I'd sure appreciate if you'd show some love for Mr. Media's advertisers, including Stitcher. Apple named Stitcher a top five news app of 2011. It's a free mobile app for your smartphone or tablet that lets you listen to your favorite shows and discover the best of news, entertainment, and sports on demand. You can listen whenever you want to to more than 5,000 shows, get customized recommendations, and discover what your friends are listening to. My own list of Stitcher favorites is pretty eclectic. I start my day with an hour of MSNBC's Morning Joe with Joe Scarborough and Mika Brzezinski. Then it's the latest two-minute update from the Onion News Network. After that, I'll listen to WTF with Mark Maron, Here's the Thing with Alec Baldwin, HBO's Real Time with Bill Maher, and excerpts from E's Chelsea Lately and The Soup with Joel McHale. Also in regular rotation on my Stitcher playlist, The BS Report with ESPN's Bill Simmons, the TechCrunch headlines, and the Don Geronimo Show. The latest episodes of each show, whether originating from broadcasts, cable TV, radio syndication, or podcasts, are continuously updated. Stitcher is a free app for your iPhone, iPad, Kindle, Fire, Blackberry, Droid, and more. And show your support of Mr. Media by getting, did I mention it's free? The app at stitcher.com slash mrmedia. That's stitcher.com slash mrmedia. Stitcher Smart Radio, the smarter way to listen to radio. We're also supported by Audible. Check out Audible's 30-day trial membership and download the audiobook version of the book everyone's been talking about, Fifty Shades of Grey by E.L. James. Sign up for your free trial today at audible.com slash radio. Again, audibletrial.com slash radio. And finally, if you need a disc jockey for a wedding, bar mitzvah, corporate event, or just a big old party, please consider calling 1-800-DIAL-DJs, the party authority, for all your party entertainment needs. You can call 1-800-DIAL-DJs or go to their website, 1-800-DIAL-DJs.com, and tell them Mr. Media sent you. And thanks for listening.